This is Keys to the Shop, Founder Friday Edition. Today we're talking with Julia Peixoto Peters, owner of Peixoto Coffee in Arizona. Well, hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeTherio. I am your host for the show. Always happy to have you here. Please do take a second, just a second, to subscribe to Keys to the Shop. It really makes a big difference in how we know how many people are actually listening to the show and for people who are wanting to discover great stories of founders like today's episode or tools and insights for running a great coffee bar or having a great coffee career helps them find the show way easier. Also, what helps is sharing these episodes on social media with your team, with your email list and newsletters and all that fun stuff, wherever you can share keys to the shop, that would be awesome. And please do uh, consider leaving a five-star rating or review over on Apple Podcasts as well. That especially helps. And uh, thank you so much, everybody, for uh, those of you who have already done that. I am eternally grateful. And now, if you are interested in one-on-one coaching, if consultation is something that you have been considering over the course of the last few years in your business as you have been growing and looking at your um, operations and the culture and you want an assessment of where you are and a bit of a roadmap for how to get to the next level or the next stage of your growth as a business. It looks different for everybody but one of the things that Keys to the Shop Consulting does is helps you clarify and then helps you walk through the steps of actually getting there. And so that could include profitability. It could include shifting culture and scaling your business. I've worked with many, many people who have had various uh, needs in their business. And it's been so rewarding to see people break through to the next level in their business. So if you're looking for one-on-one coaching, something that is custom to where you are and something that will give you the tools to succeed for years following our project together as consultant and client, I think working with Keys to the Shop Consulting might be the right fit for you. So email chris at keys to the shop.com. That's C-H-R-I-S at keys to the shop.com. We'll have a free discovery call and talk all about how I might be able to help you and it'd be my pleasure to do so. So in addition to this really quickly, you know, the key holder coaching group is the mastermind group of owners, coffee shop owners who are dedicated to accountability, encouragement, insights, and doing this coffee life together in a organized setting hosted by myself over 12 calls, six months, Each call, we focus on individual problems or challenges that members of that group are bringing to the group. And so far, this inaugural group that we've had has been so rewarding and has already made a big difference in the lives of the participants. And that could be you. And I would really love for you to sign up for early registration. New groups are going to be launched in March for the Keyholder Coaching Groups. And if you want to be a part of that, email me, chris at keystotheshop.com. And or you can reach out on Instagram at keystotheshop. And you should probably just be following Keys to the Shop on Instagram anyway. So (laughs) go ahead and reach out. Let me know. And we'll have a conversation too. And you will get on the list for early access for registration to be considered for the Keyholder coaching groups. All right. So I want to give a shout out to our sponsors today because, you know, we can't really do this show without their help. It really is an encouraging thing to have uh, companies that are partnering with Keys to the Shop and helping spread these great messages to the people. One of those people that I love has been so well received in the industry is Ground Control. Now the Ground Control Brewer uses SCA award-winning technology to give you access to an incredible range of flavors and extraction possibilities that previous iterations of batch brewing uh, just couldn't do. And not only is this a next level batch brewer, which opens up so many possibilities for flavor in your coffee, it also makes espresso concentrates for iced lattes and eight minute cold brew, which opens up so many possibilities for catering, for efficiency in your shop. The new brewer, the ground control Cyclops brewer, the original, Now we have a new brewer that costs 45% less than the Cyclops Brewer with Early Bird Special. And it's much shorter than the original. It's 24 inches high, but it's got 30% higher volume for batch espresso and cold brew concentrates. 
It's cloud connected to a smart dispenser that tracks all your brewing data. So go to groundcontrol.coffee to learn more about this brewer. Take advantage of this new brewer in the special 45% less 30% higher output for batch espresso and cold brew concentrate. This machine, it just keeps getting better and better. And so I think you should really consider this for your cafe. Go to groundcontrol.coffee to learn more. Now, the other sponsor I really want to give a shout out to is Barista Series. The Barista Series is the OG in plant-based milk. So the original plant-based milk, what is that? The Actually, not OG, it's O-P-B-M. The, the original <laughs> plant-based milk <laughs> whatever. But uh, the barista series is amazing. And the company at Pacific that handles this and interacts with the coffee community has always been one of advocacy and listening. That's why the products in the barista series perform the way they do. They're made for baristas with a lot of input from baristas. Takes the steaming really well. It stands up to the heat from the steaming process. It actually creates great texture for latte art and the balance of the flavor in your cup actually focuses on the coffee as well. So if you are interested in this, you need to go to pacificfoodservice.com and learn more, uh, get samples and try it for yourself. And I think the proof is in the tasting. I think you're gonna be impressed. And if you're looking for the best plant-based beverages to serve your customers, I think you should try the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, everyone. Well, you know, this year is seven years of Keys to the Shop. It's actually January 3rd in 2024. That's coming up soon. That'll be seven years of doing Keys to the Shop. And Founder Friday has been a staple. I'm excited to do another one of these for November. And I'm really thankful. And, uh, you know, it's a season of being thankful. We have Thanksgiving here in the States, one of my favorite holidays. And so I'm really excited to welcome to the show Julia Peixoto Peters, who is the owner of Peixoto Coffee in Chandler, Arizona, and the amazing story that she has to tell about the vertically integrated model of coffee that they represent. And here's the story. Julia Peixoto was born and raised in a coffee farming family in Southern Brazil. She watched her father and relatives give their lives to produce the best coffees they could. But when they sold the coffees, they were at the mercy of the ups and downs of the market. And Julia wanted to make a better life for her family and the farmers in that region and create more equity in the coffee trading game. And, you know, from the middlemen to the farmers, the farmers who bear the brunt of most of the risk involved in coffee production. So Julia and her husband, Jeff, left uh, corporate careers and started Peixoto Coffee in 2015. And the goal was to produce, import, roast, and bring to the market coffees that were farmed in their own family farm. And that would challenge the status quo and kind of shift the market and represent well the coffees of Brazil. And they have done this and more. Julia has been a speaker with the Producer Roaster Forum and elsewhere locally as well as nationally. Julia has this model through what she calls a calling to uh, this mission and robust systems and a dedication to relationship. Peixoto Coffee has demonstrated the viability of this kind of vertically integrated model. It's super refreshing and very hopeful and encouraging. And we get to hear the story today about the founding and evolution of this brand, the model, what goes into making it successful, and words of encouragement to those out there in the coffee community who want to encourage and maybe even take on a model like this in their business. I think this is going to be super inspirational, so let's get right to it. Here now is my conversation with Julia Peixoto Peters of Peixoto Coffee. Well, Julia, welcome to Keys to the Shop. How are you today? I'm well, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. I'm real excited to be here today. I mentioned this to you before. I'm a longtime listener, first time caller. I'm so excited to even be able to use this expression. But truly, Keys to the Shop has been one of my favorite podcasts over the years of business ownership. So I'm finally thrilled to be here talking to you. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. And, you know, I'm excited to dive into your story and especially the connection you have with coffee, which is a great place to start, I suppose, you know, with now you have, I believe, two locations of Peixoto in Arizona. You know, this was something you grew up in, not in coffee shops necessarily, but a coffee farming family in Brazil. Tell me a little bit about how growing up in a coffee family kind of affected you in your perception of the industry at a young age? 
Yeah, so I grew up in southern Brazil, in, in the state of Minas Gerais in Brazil, which is a coffee growing region in Brazil. And uh, everyone in my family farmed coffee. My father was and is a coffee farmer. My grandfather was a coffee farmer his whole life. My aunts and uncles and cousins, everyone was involved in coffee in one capacity or another. So I grew up in this environment where coffee as an agricultural product was a living and breathing thing in our family. And I grew up watching my family farm coffees. And when it was time to sell those coffee, they were typically at the mercy of the market, the unknowns of the market. And you know this, Chris, and, and most of the people in your audience who know this as well, but the commodities market is really not a stable market for farmers, right? So there are the mercy of the ups and downs, mostly the downs of the commodities market with some years prices so low, well below the cost of production. So that's what I remember in my family, the struggles of farmers to produce and give their lives to this product, but then not necessarily making ants meet in their production and being able to sustain their livelihoods of farming. So uh, I didn't really know why it was done that way. I was too young, perhaps, to, to ask the right questions, but I just knew that that's how it was done, and it was pretty rigid in you know, my family, that that's how coffee was traded, that's how it was farmed. And then fast forward, I had this in me to get outside of Brazil to study and to pursue other opportunities. Growing up in Brazil in the early 80s, uh, Brazil was a country where there's a lot of instability, it was a military dictatorship. So for my family and my parents especially, it was really important that I and my sisters pursued more stable careers, more professional careers than relying in coffee. So not only I didn't see this coming, that I would be eventually involved in coffee, I was not exactly encouraged to follow the family tradition of coffee farming. So with that, I took on a different path. I went to law school in Brazil. I came to the U.S. in the early 2000s to do a master's in international trade law. Then I got a job at a really large company, one of the largest companies in the world, where I worked as a lawyer for 13 years. I met my husband, who also had a professional career. He was an aerospace engineer. Uh, we had kids, so we had a, a good life that I didn't have to run away from. But at the same time, I was, now I know, lacking purpose or lacking a connection to where it all began. So that's how my search for meaning and which now we know it ended up back to my roots, but that's how it started. So was the first thought in coming to that conclusion that a coffee shop was the thing to connect you or... Was it simply the urge to find that connection, be it through trade, which you had already had some experience with on the back end professionally, or how did that idea to express that connection and make that pivot happen? This is the most critical question. I'm really glad that you're asking it. So in 2012, my grandfather passed away. And with the passing of my grandfather, I came to realize at that point, my father was almost 70 years old, still farming coffee, still trading coffee the same way he did when I was a child in Brazil in the commodities market. I came to realize that my father was the last one of his siblings still farming coffee. And with the passing of my grandfather, I felt what I describe as a higher calling mm -hmm. to do something with my family's coffee. So it didn't come to me as a coffee shop or even as roasted coffee, because all I knew was the farming side, the agricultural side of coffee that ran in my family. So I just knew I had to do something to, one, keep my family's legacy in coffee farming beyond the life of my parents alive, and two, to make it better for my family and for other farmers 
in the region to be able to trade their coffees in a better way, in a way where the equity of the coffee trading game stays in the hands of the farmers and not the middlemen. So I had these two ideas that or two goals that I wanted to accomplish, but I didn't know how. I had no experience on the consumer side of the market. I was a avid coffee drinker. I consumed coffee. I spent time at coffee shops, but I was not necessarily well-versed on the consumer side of the market. So in, in your pursuit of understanding to make this a reality, what was the first step? It was education about the things you didn't know or just stepping into something you did and, and going from there? Yes. Yeah, so it was both, I would say. Uh, there was definitely a leap into the unknown that involved jumping into an area I knew nothing about. I had never run a business. I had never had any experience in the hospitality industry per se. But with that idea, with the higher calling, that, as I call, that I received, I had to do something that would be different than what had been done before. And I had to do something that would keep my family's legacy in coffee farming alive, but it would make it better. So... When I started to think of this idea and, and I just knew with every cell of my being that I had to do something with it. There was never any question, like, should I pursue this path? There was just a, a question as to how am I going to pursue this path? But when we started to brainstorm ideas, and this was my husband and I right. about the business, we thought that we were importing my family's coffee and then selling green coffee to roasters in the country. I knew I wanted to open doors in the U.S. market for my family's coffee. So I started to think, how can I do that? And I remember I had great support from mentors and people that I admired and, right. and respected. And I remember hearing something or someone say, surround yourself by the people who are already doing what you're trying to do. So I went on a mission to find people who were doing what I thought I wanted to do. And I came across some key people in the industry at that time, again, coming from the outside and not really having any connections. I had to establish those connections with people. So I reached out to one person in particular who was from Brazil, happens to be from the same region I'm from, and he was importing coffee into the United States and selling green. So I reached out to him. You may know of him or may know him personally. He's very active in the specialty industry. His name is Ricardo yes. Pereira. Yes. And he's still my coffee guru. <laughs> That's awesome. He's been on the show. Yeah. Yeah. So so Ricardo was instrumental on our path. And the way it all worked out was it's actually very interesting because I reached out to him and he was about to go to Brazil. A few days after we got in touch, we had, back then was a Skype call, <laughs> and uh, he was on his way to Brazil to visit a farmer who was our neighbor. You know, of all regions in Brazil, of all coffee producers in Brazil, he was scheduled to visit our neighboring farm just a few days later after we spoke. So that was in a way, one of those moments that I felt like I must be doing the right thing, you know, if this is showing up on my path. Yeah, it's a real confirmation. Mm -hmm. So so he did. He went to the farm. He met my parents before we ever met in person. And then he came back from Brazil with my family coffee. And he said, I think you're on to something. I think you can do this. So he embraced us, my husband and I, and our cause, and we started to to do a lot of brainstorming uh, along the way. And and he was the one who told us, if you really want to do this, I wouldn't just stop at selling green. Green is a very risky business. It's probably not what you are what you're trying to do. So. We started to look into roasting our own coffee, and then we, the idea was that we're going to sell roasted coffee. But at some point in this evolution, and it was there was a lot of late nights, a lot of pencil to paper, a lot of business planning. At some point on, on this journey, we decided if I truly want to keep my family's legacy alive, then I need to go all the way to the end consumer, to the coffee shop and put my family's coffee in the cup of 
coffee drinkers as they show to coffee. So they need to experience the coffee. It's something that you need to be highly involved with because if you were in doing if you're just doing green coffee you're not really in charge of the whole experience you know you give it off to somebody else and you know that's fine that's that's helpful but what is it that getting the coffee into people's hands and having a little bit more of a, a say in the experience of the final product how does that really bring it home to create value and achieve the goals that you had for more equity and more ownership in the supply chain? Yeah, so the model that we chose to pursue is, is one where it didn't happen overnight, obviously. It was, a, it was a long process of putting pieces together and chipping away things that were not serving our model or, or this vision that we had for patient coffee. But the idea is that we eliminate steps in the process, right? So traditionally, the supply chain, the coffee supply chain is long and the coffee moves from hand to hand to hand. And it's very horizontal, right? Where the coffee is moving on this horizontal supply chain through the players in the industry. So the idea was that we needed to shrink the supply chain by eliminating unnecessary steps uh, along the way for us. And then we also wanted to flip the supply chain over and achieve what we call today a vertical integration or vertically integrated supply chain from the farm to the end consumer. And what that means is that Peixoto, as a family, as a business, we farm, we export, we import our own coffees, we roast, and we put it in the hands of end consumers. So the value of this supply chain comes in the sense of we're freeing resources along the way. And I'm talking about financial resources, right? So I'm freeing financial resources along the supply chain and I'm putting those freed up resources in the hands of farmers, whether it's my family or, or other farmers that we buy coffees from and in the hands of end consumers by bringing a coffee that is direct, that is sustainable, that is transparent, right? Every coffee that we release, we know exactly where it came from. I know the lot at our farm where the coffee was harvested, how many days it spent on drying, what processes we apply to those coffees. So there's a lot of things that make those coffees special and specialty, right? A lot of knowledge that is carried over with the coffee and quality as well, because again, like we have a lot of participation in how these coffees are farmed and, and processed and transported. And then we translate that into a customer experience that is unique. That hadn't been done at least extensively before we started where Customers feel like they are part of the journey of coffees from their farm to the coffee shop, to their cups, and for a competitive price, right? Because we're freeing up resources along the way and putting a more direct, sustainable quality coffee in the hands, in the cups of end consumers. Yeah. Okay. So there's two things. One, I would say, is your point at which you started to see the benefit return to the farm in this endeavor. And now, I mean, it's almost 10 years of doing this, right? That's right. Yeah. One year away. And in the first couple of years, I imagine there's a lot of trial and error, finessing the system, making sure that the tangible benefit is there for the growers, the farmers, right? How did you start to evolve that in what things did you need to pivot in this model in order to make sure that that was going to happen over the long haul? There has been a lot of pivots <laughs> along the way, as I'm sure you can understand. Business or businesses in general don't come with a manual. Ours certainly didn't come with one. We were pioneering a lot of these things through trials and errors, and that's certainly the case 
all the way through today. We're constantly having to reinvent ourselves and create new things from the ground up. So that has been a constant in our journey since its inception in 2015. So we started with the idea that we would be vertically integrated. It didn't start like that from the beginning. We had to rely, still rely on exporters and importers to get our coffees from Brazil to here. We were small. Year one, 2015, we imported, we picked a number. We we're 100 bags, sounds about right. So we we chose to import 100 bags of coffee. That's, that's nothing for these big ship lines and for big importers, right. right? So we were dealing with very small volumes, small volumes that are not necessarily, you know, what some of these big players want to be doing. So we had to pave that path of like starting really small and then growing our way up to where we are today and the volumes that we do today. So we couldn't achieve that vertical integration right off the inception of the business. So it took us about three years to get there where in, I think it was 2018 when we became importers of record and we we took control of the entire supply chain. So, so yes, a lot of trials and errors. And I think those very things made us stronger <laughs> and, uh, you know, more resilient in what we're doing because in business in general, you're going to need that, especially when you're doing things for the first time in an industry. So yeah, it's all a part of the growth process. And I always like to look back and think that in a way, a lot of coffee businesses in the United States, they start when the coffee is in the country, right? So coffee is imported, coffee is available at one of the big importers, warehouse, the annex or different parts of the country. And that's where the roaster's job process begins. For us, that's two-thirds of the way already there, right? Because we do work year-round at the farm level to make sure that the coffees, the crops are looking good to meet our quality criteria. And we have a plan of harvest. We go every year. We get our hands dirty at the farm where we're you know, processing coffees during the harvest season. And then we wait until those lots are ready. We get samples of those lots, we cup and, and decide which lots we want to bring in. And then we sit and wait some more where, <laughs> you know, when the coffee is being milled and prepared for export, there's a lot of back and forth with governments in Brazil and customs and brokering here in the U.S. as well. And then the coffee leaves on containers through the oceans, Atlantic, Panama Canal, Pacific Ocean, and then it lands in California, and then it gets transported to our warehouse in Arizona, then we break the seal of those containers, and that's when, you know, the roasting and the, the QCing and the brewing and all the planning for the year ahead begins. But really, two-thirds of our work has been done at that point when we receive our coffees here in the U.S., and in fact, it starts years before. So your background in law and trade, obviously, or it's obvious to me, or maybe I'm assuming that it comes in pretty handy. It does. And uh, my husband has a background in aerospace engineering, and that comes in handy as well. Maybe I can draw the connection for you. But uh, yeah, so I think that both our backgrounds have been instrumental in our success because I think a lot of a lot of people are passionate about coffee and we are too but you know and I had to do this as a self discovery process over the years right to figure out what am I truly passionate about because I am passionate about coffee I'm passionate about extracting a perfect shot of espresso a beautiful pour at latte but truthfully I'm passionate about keeping the business alive. <laughs> <laughs> so I do derive a lot of enjoyment and satisfaction out of, you know, having a, a business that is organized, that has longevity, that has systems and organizations that will support the growth. So I think that my background in law comes in handy when it comes to 
establishing those structures, those systems, those strong contracts and, you know, the things that most people don't want to deal with or, or, or don't enjoy dealing with. I enjoy putting together, you know, whether it's a lease agreement for one of our facilities or <laughs> if it's an HR policy that we need to put in place that will ensure that we have fair practices and longevity for, for the business. I enjoy that aspect of the business. So it does come in handy. We haven't paid the lawyer <laughs> in the last nine years of our business. Nice. Got one in-house. So many people that may not be let's say, wired to derive a pretty quick sense of enjoyment from taking on these particular things still need them in order to get the stability that they actually do want in their business, whether they use other people or not. The idea, of course, on this show, we talk about systems and the idea of their importance for a business. But I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about, because you're not just doing this by yourself you have other people who are also responsible for systems. So how do you communicate the value of the often thankless and maybe anonymous backend work that goes to create the bedrock for the experience itself so that it, it is embraced and ra rather than procrastinated on or uh, half baked and, and that kind of thing, how, how do we really embrace this and how do you teach others to do so? So systems and procedures and documentation has been a bedrock of our business from the beginning. And like I said, I think a lot has to do with my background, the background of my husband. He runs our wholesale and production mm -hmm. operations, and he's created incredible systems and procedures for that side of the business. He actually created the software that we use to roast our coffee as well and ensure it's scalable and replicable, uh, roast after roast. But uh, And I think from the beginning, because we had these careers that were solid and stable and that we didn't have to run away from, but we chose to. We both chose to leave behind these successful careers to pursue, you know, a, a vision and, and this higher calling that I received. I think that for us, it, would, it only made sense if we were able to do so in a way that was stable enough right, for us to leave off it. We were not doing a passion project per se. We're building a business. So yeah. from the beginning, it was very important that we, we had business structures that would support the business, whether it's, you know, the finance, whether it's the people. From the very beginning, I was very keen on hiring managers to run the shops and to be, uh, you know, operationally in charch of running the shops. So yeah, so we wanted to build a business. We just didn't want to just build a passion project. We wanted to create something that would be sustainable and that would have longevity in the long run. So we've been very keen from the beginning to have policies, to have handbooks, to have SOPs in place that would sustain growth and also would sustain our freedom that we wanted to create with the business. We wanted to, the business to, and, and my husband is always very vocal on these with every endeavor which we embark on, whether it's, you know, creating a production facility or cold brewing in large scale, or whether it's supporting wholesale customers, supporting the coffee shops, he's always of this idea that he's putting himself out of a job, right? So he's creating a system and an organization that can run whether he's there or not. Yes. So I learned a lot of that from him in terms of thinking that today I have health, I'm here, and but what if I'm not, right? And from year one, when we created the business, we also, it's part of our business case. It's part of our business plan, that we would remove ourselves during the summer time, the summer season, because that's harvest season in Brazil. And we wanted to be there at the farm oh, yeah. with my family, helping them harvest and process the coffees, which we would later on import. So this has been a part of our vision for the business, that we would not be physically present at the business for about a month or so during the harvest season. So yes, we created this structure 
and organization systems procedures that would support that vision. Yeah, so I just keep thinking about this contrast between when you mentioned the passion project and there's almost an inherent flippancy with the idea that we're just going to start a coffee bar and we're just going to do the see if it works, you know. But knowing the background that you have and the hard slog that it is to be a farmer in a farming community, there is no flippancy in that. There's no this is just a passion project. This is a life thing and it feels so fitting whether you are connected directly to the farm or not if you're just an entrepreneur that is serving coffee to people it feels like you kind of owe it to everyone else who's working really hard to make this more than a passion project to make it like a a real serious business that will i, I suppose in, in the result of all of your systems and the seriousness with which you treat your business reap the reward of enjoying it more because you're not worried as much as you would be if you didn't have systems. You're absolutely right. And I love the way you you put it. It is kind of a like my call of duty, right? To make this work for the farmers, for my family, for all the employees and the livelihoods that we support, right? I feel like I wouldn't be making justice to the vision the calling that I had and uh, my ability to support the model if I was doing in a scale that was too small or, or not sustainable in the long run. So I see my duty as, you know, creating a business that can be sustainable and sustainability means more than, than environmental sustainability. It means sustaining livelihoods, sustaining the living of these people who rely on coffee to carry on. So so yes, I take that as my responsibility now that I've started the business to keep it alive, but keep it alive and well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Beyond my parents' life, beyond my life, and into future generations. That breeds a lot of resiliency into when things happen that are hard. It's not a matter of saying, well, maybe we'll just give up. It's just a matter of finding solutions, not not a matter of exiting because of that higher calling that you were talking about. Absolutely. Yes. And we've had our fair share of challenge <laughs> and rugs pulled from underneath our feet, just like any other business, right? We've had ups and downs and we've had... Uh, rough water. So, so yes, it's that duty of responsibility for the lives of farmers and the employees who depend on our business today that keeps us going and not just looking for an exit when things happen. What goes into the retail part of this? As you integrate your uh, supply chain into the business over these years, and then there's also the curation of the experience to accurately and, and exceed the expectations of customers. So when it comes to your first shop and what you set out to do, what was the concept for the coffee and the service and the hospitality? And and how has that now translated over the years into these two shops? When we started in 2015, almost nine years ago, the industry looked very different than it does today. Um, I'm sure you can appreciate this, Chris, but we were starting a coffee shop. You know, the specialty industry was just starting here in Arizona, in Phoenix specifically. There are only maybe one or two players in the industry. And there is a lot of rules around of how businesses conducted themselves in the specialty realm. There's a lot of stigmas and a lot of, you know, unspoken rules of like, oh, if you're a specialty shop, then you don't serve sugar with your coffee or you don't serve cream or, you know, we like washed Ethiopias or washed Colombian coffees. We don't. And here we are starting a shop serving Brazils. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Right. So there's a lot of stigma around Brazilian coffees. There's this understanding that Brazilian coffees were quantity based and not quality based. So we had, we had some work to do. We had a lot of stigmas to break. And I felt like I would serve my cause better to change lives of farmers and change the equity of the game 
by reaching as many people as I could. So I didn't just stick to what was done. I was starting from my own vision because I came from the outside. I really didn't have a whole lot of limitations as to what should be done for us to be accepted as a specialty coffee shop or a specialty roaster. I just, I had this vision that I had to deliver on. So I, we decided to start from there and, and start converting people. So we, you know, from the beginning, we decided we want to reach as many people as possible. We needed to reach the middle of the pyramid, not just the top of the pyramid of specialty coffee drinkers at that time, we wanted to reach the middle of the pyramid. So we set out to serve coffee in a very accessible way, in a very friendly way. There's a lot of stigmas around what a specialty barista should be as well. And we wanted to break that mold and serve in an environment that is friendly, that is familiar to people, that is welcoming and comfortable to people, but also in an environment that meets people where they're at, right? So from the beginning, we, we added sugar to, to our menu, because, but we wanted to do it in a way that would make justice to our coffee as well. I just didn't want to offer sugar drinks, like, like the big names in the industry. We did in a way that it was high quality, that was unique with our seasonal menu. We're known for that now here in the Phoenix area. We come up with very unique, seasonal, never before drinks. So that's how we kind of broke the mold, but also we needed to change the perception around Brazilian coffees, right? So I remember there's a lot of people who would say, oh, I only drink washed coffees. Natural coffees are no good. They're not of the same quality. And in most of my family's production is naturals. So, you know, we were dealing with a lot of preconceived notions that we had to break. So we started bringing these coffees that were not only naturals, but they're high quality, specialty grade coffees. And we're, we're changing the palates of consumers and changing their idea of what coffees from Brazil could taste like, or coffee specialty drinks would taste like. So there's a lot of changed behavior over the years simply by meeting people where they were at and, and giving them a new way of, of experiencing their coffee. When you talk about changing people's minds over the years, I imagine some of this is resulting in just the fact that you see more business in the cafes and more purchasing of the beans itself, but in conversations that you have with your customers as well. And at the same time, over the years, businesses like yours, because you're pioneering these vertically integrated supply chains into your business, it's not just Arizona. It's also the industry that's paying attention to what you're doing, because there's this innate sense of hope that, hey, this is this is a solution, this is an option. So we're not just you know using the same old models. How did you start to see what you were doing advance beyond the reach of your local community where they are starting to be like, hey, this Brazilian coffee is a lot better than I ever really gave it time for. I'm really glad for Peixoto. But then I know you participated in the producer roaster forum, you know, in the industry, we're having these conversations a lot now. How did all of this kind of begin to happen where you became sort of a, a spokesperson for this kind of a model? I think that the moment I realized that Peixoto had taken a life of its own and a more national direction than what I expected it to be. Of course, when, when I started the business, I wanted it to be successful and impactful mostly, but I, I just didn't know how impactful it could be or how well received it could be by the community. I think that the first time I realized that was probably in SCA somewhere in Seattle or, right. you know, one of those uh, conferences where people would see our logo and recognize and uh, were able to actually pronounce the name, <laughs> <laughs> which was, you know, the very beginning. I heard so many iterations of, of the name and not, not, not even close. But yes, for the longest time, we were, you know, uh, we're the newcomers, we're the outsiders here in the Phoenix community. 
at some point, and it was very rapid when this happened, I would say maybe 2016, 17, we started to see some recognition of the brand, of the name, and recognition for the impact that we're having, right? By having a, a different business model. So yes, that is something I'm very grateful for. I love being involved in the community, especially on the producer, the farming side of things. I It makes my, my soul sing when I am at the farm level with farmers. When I was in Colombia recently visiting farms, I just... I felt this is where we can have the biggest impact, right? Because a lot of these farmers are, are, are still at the mercy of dealing with big buyers in country and not having access to the consumer market. So when you bring this story of, of connection, of achieving vertical integration, it brings then hope that they can, too, have some exposure to the buying market directly and have a connection with that side of the industry. So that's a source of, of joy for me and a critical aspect of, of my business as well. I need to be able to enjoy right, <laughs> the process. So this brings me a lot of it. Well, if you're talking about working with other countries uh, besides Brazil, what kinds of values and principles and systems did you develop in relationship to your own farms that you then apply to the sourcing of coffees from other origins besides Brazil that you have found successful? So the majority of the coffees we serve at our coffee shops come from my family farm. I would say about 80% mm -hmm. of the coffees we serve come from my family farm. And neighboring farmers as well. So we also buy from neighboring farmers in Brazil, right next to where we are. So uh, the, the other 20% are coffees that we source directly from small producers with whom we have a relationship. So we do apply those same principles of directedness, of transparency, sustainability to the coffees that we bring from other countries. So for instance, one of the outcomes of this trip that I had to Colombia was that I developed a relationship with these farmers there and we're bringing their coffees here. We'll be able to offer those coffees next year. So historically, it hasn't been always myself doing that work. I've had very critical people on our path who have invested a lot of time and resources in developing those relationships with farmers, whether it's in Costa Rica, in Colombia, in Guatemala, and we've been buying their coffees year after year. But I'm trying to free up some of my time so that I can do that going forward since it's a it's an area that I, one I have an easy time because I speak the language I speak Spanish I can I'm also from Latin America I can connect with ants and and I enjoy dealing with farmers in various countries so this is something that I want to bring back to my realm of operations but uh One of the things that we've been doing also for quite a few years now is when we buy coffees from other producers, we give them the same level of visibility as we do to my family. So rather than giving names to coffees, for instance, people come up with all sorts of cute labels and cute names for coffees. We believe in honoring the farmer and the farm. So we always put the farmer's name on our coffee label. So it, whether it's right now we have Stephen Mora, we have Los Andes from Guatemala with the Hazard family. So we always honor not, not just the origin as a single origin coffee, but also the farm and the farmer where it comes from. And that, you know, gives then that connection, which we sought to offer to my family. I wanted Peixoto to be sold as Peixoto coffee. I want their coffee to be sold as their own coffee and not as something else. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. In that principle of relationship is so strong in, in, in that there is a lot of responsibility in relationship when you are truly seeking the good of those who you are representing and you have a relationship with, it means you're going to be above board in your operations, you're dedicated to refining your process and making sure 
having due diligence to make sure this is a beneficial thing for them. And, you know, again, back to the idea that your business is going to be around to help support them, which is a a principle of longevity and sustainability, as you kind of uh, hinted at earlier, like the idea of sustainability usually exists within the uh, ecological sphere, which is fine, except that we have so much turnover of stores and brands where these relationships become severed because the coffee shop or the roastery just goes out of business. So it feels like the you know, principles that you're applying are the types of things that could really revolutionize the kind of relationships that we really want to have with farmers, which is all good and in, in fine and well-intentioned. But um, I'm, I'm glad to see such a holistic uh, approach to both ends of this equation. You recently opened a second location. I think it was in 2022. And so it is always fascinating to me to to hear about how things go when you go from one location to two locations. I know you have the systems, but surely there's some, some challenges in doing the expansion thing with a concept like yours. So how did that go? How did it come about? And, and what were some of the things that you needed to adjust in the process of expanding Peixoto? Certainly, yes. So going from one location, and, and the second location was in the works for about four or five years. Because when we started, it was pre-COVID and then came COVID. So a lot of things got delayed, paused for a few years really. So, so the second location was a dream in the making for a really long time, <laughs> but we went from one small shop and our, our first shop in Chandler is, you know, physically small, but we, we do move some volumes there. It's a high volume coffee shop. We have people pouring in and out all day long. So we've always operated as a high volume coffee shop. But we moved from a very small and close-knit organization to, you know, we doubled our staff last year to open our new shop. Our new shop in an up-and-coming location, a lot of residential developments around it. So we knew it would be even higher volumes than our first one. And it has been from the get-go. So we had to double our staff ensure that we would do so, we would be able to serve higher volumes in a way that would keep our quality intact and would scale our services as well. So there was a lot of planning for that moment. And again, I'm, I'm grateful that you know, it took longer than expected to actually open the shop because it gave us a lot of time to, <laughs> yes. to develop those systems, to implement procedures and to find the right people that would, that would embark on this journey of growing the business and growing in a way where we were maintaining our standards of quality and service. So challenge, yes, there's always, <laughs> whether you stay small or whether you grow, there are always challenges. But uh, I honestly feel like everything is workable. There's no challenge that is unsurmountable. It's just a matter of breaking it in small pieces and dealing with those parts along the way. So whether it's um, assembling a team to open a new shop and that comes with a suite of challenges in ensuring everyone is in alignment with the vision, in alignment with with the goals for the business, for growth, whether it's, you know, creating new products, whether it's, you know, going through a pandemic, there's challenges are comprised of very small parts. So if you break the challenges in small parts and address them individually, I think, you know, that is always doable. And there's an author that, uh, that I love. Her name is Marie Forleo. You may want to look into her and perhaps uh, invite her for your podcast in the future. But she wrote a book that's called Everything is Figure Outable. And I like to think of challenges in terms of how can I figure this out, right? And, and instill this procedural mindset as well in my management so that as 
challenges arise that they're able to break it down and solve the small pieces, the small components of the challenge. That's great. You are hitting on something, I think, like the empowering people to have a perspective that's a hopeful one towards inevitable challenges and choosing the right people to be with you in the expression of retail in, is such a critical component. Similar, maybe in fact, to the you know, choosing of you know, what happens on the, the raw product side of things and partnering with farmers. If I have a crew of people who is maybe not the right fit for, for what I'm doing, then every, all the work is just going to not come to fruition the way that I want it to. And so for something like this, you really have to be choosy about who's going to work at Peixoto and what is it that is the primary characteristic or top values that you look for in an individual who can really represent the brand well and all that it is trying to accomplish. Ooh, there's a lot, obviously, <laughs> but if I, if I had to distill it down to a couple of traits or, or skill sets that we look for, and we've had a lot of wonderful people come and go through our journey, and I believe that everyone has their path and, you know, they come. We always want them to leave better people than when they first came to pay show to coffee. But one of the things that I always look for in those people who are going to join us on this journey is resourcefulness. Again, because of this mindset of figuring stuff out and problem solving and not being given the answer, but finding the resources or, you know, by now we do have a lot of resources within the company, a lot of knowledge within the company, but looking for resources to solve problems, I would say is on the top of my list. So resourcefulness. And I always look for alignment with the vision as well. So for those people applying for a position with Peixoto Coffee, there's a lot of questions online that we ask before they're able to submit their resume. But a lot of those questions have to do with alignment with our vision, right? Because not just for me, but, and, and like I said, now Peixoto Coffee is an entity of its own. It's no longer myself, just like, parenting, right? To raise your kids and then they become individuals. They're yeah. no longer yeah. an expression of the parent. So it's the same with Peixoto. It has its own individuality and its own path to follow. So, but because Peixoto is infused with this very clear vision, and I think that that has been one of my biggest lessons in business is to, there, there will be a lot of distractions. There will be a lot of detours along the way. But it's uh, my job as CEO of the company is to bring the company to the vision, right? Is to make sure that we are at all times, whether we're cleaning the shop or whether we're putting out a new product or we're establishing a new relationship with a farmer. My job is to make sure it happens in alignment with the vision. So we do the same when we're when we're bringing people to the team. We want to make sure that there is that fundamental alignment with the vision of Peixoto Coffee. And then everything else we can teach, right? right? Yeah. Whether it's technical skills, whether it's barista we can teach those things, but we, I cannot teach alignment and I cannot teach resourcefulness. Mm, that's wonderful. And you have to find that and source it. And I love the idea that coffee shops and models of business are all things that are figure outable. They're discoverable. And they exist for these moments where they need to in order to produce change that is taken by other people and moved even further than we ourselves can do. So uh, having those uh, team members by your side to expand what you can do is, is so critical. And, uh, you know, one of the last questions I, I, I want to like wrap up here with is I imagine and, and I know this for a fact because I see this proliferating in the industry, this kind of model of vertical integration and creating more of a direct to consumer model and more ownership of the supply chain. If people are listening to this and they're thinking, yes, this is something that I want to do. This is maybe even something that I want to partner with somebody on and, um, or just want to take the first step in. 
what is it that they need to be aware of that are the the major hurdles that they should be prepared for that you can help prepare them to meet based on your experience? So I'll focus more on the vertical integration aspect of things, right? Because I think that that's what is truly unique about us. I would say that for people that want to take steps towards that. And again, it's not going to happen overnight. In my situation, it happened because I have that family connection, but you don't have to have a family connection. You can start taking steps towards, you know, supporting farmers, buying directly, understanding what the farmers actually make when you make a purchase of coffee through an importer, through an exporter, what percentage of what you're paying is actually going to the hands of farmers? So I think it starts with questions, right? By asking questions to understand what is truly reaching the farmers. But farmers need predictability and they need consistency, right? So a lot of people buy coffees when they when the coffees are tasting amazing, it's a 90 point coffee and uh, I want to have this coffee uh, to be served at my coffee shop. But what farmers truly need, farmers are not going to be able to, some, some are able to, those very small boutique farmers are able to consistently produce competition grade coffee, 90 plus point coffees, but not all farmers are able to do that. So those farmers, and I think that that's the bulk of farmers, it's not the top of the pyramid of farmers, the bulk of farmers need consistency and predictability year after year, not just when their coffees are drinking high 80s, 90 points, but also when they have a hard year and and they all do right so last year was a really hard year for farmers in brazil they they had a drought and they had frost and and they saw their production decrease by almost 50 percent which is drastic certainly not an year when they're making any money they're losing a lot of money so they need buyers for those coffees too so making a commitment to certain farming models where you know you expect a certain quality but as long as the farmer is showing steps towards that direction right towards that level of quality that you commit to buying coffee from the same farmers year after year because that's what they need they need to know that they have a market to sell their coffees before their harvest ever starts most of these farmers are you know financing their crops for and putting everything on the line to be able to produce and to harvest, to to deliver those coffees. So making a commitment to them that you're going to buy their coffees if, if, of course, it's okay to have some standards of quality. I'm not saying just ditch every standard of quality, but committing to the longevity of the relationship, I would say is very important for this model to be sustainable and to have longevity. Yeah, that's wonderful. And that is, uh, again, one of those things that you figure out, right? If it's not as good as you wanted it to be, then you figure it out. A lot of people will put it, they'll say, well, we could put it in a blend or we can maybe roast it slightly differently. There's a lot of ways to do it. And certainly we want our local communities to give us grace in the times where our businesses may wane in our quality or our consistency. If, if COVID was any testament to the fact that we wanted people to give us a chance when we we're having a off year, it's exactly the same as what you're describing with farmers. Exactly. It's a, it's, it's a marriage <laughs> <laughs> <There you Through go. laughs> thick and thin, right? It's, That's right. it's, it's being there and being able to support the ups and downs of farming and, uh, you know, if there's one thing that is certain in farming is that there will be good years and not so good years. So just, you know, making a commitment towards improvement, but in the long run with farmers and working with them. Wonderful. Julia, we could talk a lot more and there's, there's more to the story that I would encourage everybody to explore themselves by exploring Peixoto and your story. And I would love to hear from you how, People can keep in touch with what you're doing. Where can we learn more? Yeah, so Peixoto Coffee is very active on social media. We're always sharing what's going on at our shops as well as production and operations. 
on our social media at Peixoto Coffee. We have a website where we ship things all over the U.S. We ship coffees all over the U.S. for those of you that want to try. But uh, that's how we can stay in touch. We'd love to uh, stay in touch with you as well, Chris. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share my story and my vision with your audience, which, again, I'm a part of this audience <laughs> as well, have been listening for for many years, I can't remember when you started, but I want to say I've been listening to episodes since 2018, 2019. Around 2017 somewhere. we started, yeah. 2017, yeah. And, and, and again, I'm really appreciative of what you bring to the community because as an owner, starting a business in coffee, it, I've said this before, it doesn't come with a manual. So having a podcast such as yours where you can find you know, relatable situations, stories, actionable change to implement within our business is, is truly invaluable. So I appreciate what you would do to the industry. I appreciate you, those kind words. That's really awesome. I'm so glad to have you as one of the uh, audience members of the show for sure. And now as a guest. So uh, thank you again, Julia. It was wonderful. Thank you, Chris. Well, everybody, I hope that you really enjoyed that conversation. I'm so thankful. Thank you so much to Julia Peixoto Peters for being on our show today. And thank you for being a listener to the show. It's a huge honor to have somebody like you in the uh, listening audience. It's awesome. So we really appreciate your insights and the example you continue to set. You know, this conversation really inspired me with the idea that our dedication to something that is beyond the um, challenges that come with projects is what makes us able to weather those storms. That is relationship and dedication to having a long-term commitment to those you are partnering with, whether that's in the cafe or that is with your farming partners. It is a great point to really dwell on as a result of this conversation. There's many more things that Julia shared that we should reflect on. But again, I'm really thankful to have had Julia on the show. And if you're interested in learning more about Peixoto Coffee, you can just go to Peixoto Coffee dot com and that is where you can find all of their locations in arizona as well as buy their coffee online you can find peixoto coffee on instagram that is just at peixoto coffee that's p-e-i-x-o-t-o coffee and i hope that you follow them and get some coffee sent your way so if you have any questions comments or feedback for me about today's episode feel free to send me an email chris at keys to the shop.com that's where you can also inquire about these key holder coaching groups coming up and launching again in march as well as if you want to explore one-on-one -on -one consultation and coaching for yourself your team and your business chris at keys to the shop.com and with that, that is the end of our episode today, everybody. I really hope that you enjoyed it. Have an amazing weekend. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop. <laughs>